So I think, I hope you got the, uh, the title of this uh, session, it's 2020 Vision. Uh, and uh, I have to apologize, this is not the talk about Iron, the Ayn Rand Institute, this is a workshop, you came to work here. I'm going to recruit you for the next hour or so as uh, executive team members of the Ayn Rand Institute. So are you guys ready to work? It's good? Okay. Um, so I want to start by, by saying that, uh, you know, as Leonard Peikoff said, you have to motivate the audience before you start. But again, you're not an audience. You're now part of ARI for the next hour, so we're going to motivate ourselves, okay? Um, okay, so I found this beautiful uh, um, quote that I want to link to something that will motivate all of us in the uh, letter to the readers of The Fountainhead. Uh, it says, Aristotle said that the fiction is of greater philosophical importance than history because history represents things as they are while fiction represents them as they might be and ought to be. If you wish the, a key to the literary method of the fountainhead, this is it. So I, I was thinking, okay, so if history is things as they are and fiction is things as they could and should be, then what we do, all of us, is making the future what it could and should be, right? And this is very motivating to me. This is why I jump out of bed every day, because this is educational, I call it educational activism. This is taking the ideas and doing something to change the world, to make it a better place for me, selfishly, and hopefully for all of you. So, and if that's not inspiring for you, I found a thank you letter from Ayn Rand for all of us. And she says, to every reader, who had the intelligence to understand the fountainhead, the integrity to like it, and the courage to speak about it to every one of you, not in a mass, but personally, individually, I'm here saying thank you. So thank you everyone for being here. Thanks a lot. Okay, motivated. I wanna start at the end, okay? This is the end. <laughs> the road is cleared, said Galt. We're going back to the world. He raised his hand, and over the desolate earth, he traced in space the sign of the dollar. So I want to I kind of make it interactive for a second. I want to ask you a question. What is the word that best describes your feeling after reading your favorite Ayn Rand novel? So take out your phone for a second, and go to your text app. And to the uh, recipient 22333, uh, send the word Ocon. And think about the one word that describes how you felt when you finished one of Ayn Rand's or your favorite Ayn Rand novel. Relief. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> Energized, alive, hope, personal, terrified. Oh, that's interesting. Excited, peaceful, winning, understanding, woke, transformational, inspired, is getting bigger. Peaceful. Exhilaration, understanding, smart, damn, <laughs> that's good, <laughs> love, that's great, jubilant, sunlit, jazzy, vindication, that's great, I think inspired is winning. Okay, so, yeah, that's what you guys think. Thank you very much for this. So, let's move forward. Okay, what we're going to do is I'm going to talk about what we did last year and why we did what we did and what were the results, and then I'm going to talk about the future. And uh, I want to start with asking you that if you feel energized, and every time you see the snare drum, I'm a drummer, 
then you can, with the level of energy you have, just drum roll on your lap or on your uh, table because it's, it's an announcement. We're doing something new, okay? So if you feel, let's try, let's give it a try. Wow, awesome. Awesome, this is great. Okay, so every time you see the snare drum, something's coming. Let's start with the concept of focus. For me, uh, as, as a manager, focus is what you're managing a lot of resources and you're trying to make something happen. It's like the energy density of a laser beam. You're trying to have everyone point in the same direction because you want to make sure that your laser beam makes a ding in the universe, to paraphrase Steve Jobs. And that's what we're doing. This is why we're so dedicated to focus. Our mission is so broad, it's so abstract, that you have to start with defining what we're going to do and mostly what we're not going to do. And I hear great ideas all the time wherever I travel and meet uh, people in the communities, what, what they are I should be doing. And it's very hard to say, yes, I understand, but we're focused on this. But honestly, everyone that you explain to why, uh, the import how important focus is, they all understand. So if you remember last year, I said we're going to do three things. We're going to do content creation and we're going to measure it by number of hours produced per month. We're going to do content distribution and engagement because it means nothing to create a lot of content that nobody watches. So we're going to put a lot of energy to learn and to exe execute then on how to reach people and more people to learn about the channels of how to get work with the channels and the distribution channels to, to get to more people. And we're going to measure it by watch time per month and our reach, our YouTube subscribers, our Facebook fellow followers, and of course, all of our subscribers on campus. And then we're going to do intellectual development because this is, for me, the most important thing, making sure that we have the intellectuals, the teachers, the speakers, the writers that can carry this flame forward and, um, and making sure we have teachers who can teach the next generation. And the way we measure it, how many people, uh, we call it objectivist influencers we have because just a generic name for anyone who can speak, write, teach, mentor, and do all of those things. Okay, let's start with content creation. What have we done this year in content creation? So, as I said, how many hours of content have we created? The teal one is non-campus content. It's all of the event talks, the interviews, and all of the non-courses non-course materials that we've produced. And the orange is campus courses. As you can see, we went from 70 hours in 17. If you remember the last part, the half part of, uh, the last part of uh, 18, we've pushed a lot of content. So this is why you see the massive growth in the course content that we've pr produced and uh, released. And we've continued to do that. Over 70% growth year over year of content release to the point where I got phone calls saying, stop, slow it down. <laughs> My watch, watch later list is getting longer and longer. So uh, now we've found the rhythm and Lucy and the team is working on releasing, I think, a course a month at this point to make sure that you can all consume it. So great, great achievement. Give yourself a round of applause. This is great. Let's see what we've done inside of campus where you learn specifically objectivist content. We've released the Ayn Rand. Anyone saw all 19 uh, courses of uh, or the lessons of this course? All 19 lectures? Anyone? Yeah, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Awesome. I'm still working on it. It's amazing. It's really inspiring. And then Ayn Rand in the Columbia University, 14 different talks. And then Leonard Peikoff continued the tradition and did additional 14 talks in the Ford Hall Forum, and we've released Introduction to Logic and The Art of Thinking by Leonard Peikoff, amazing courses. And if you ask yourself what's next on campus, first drum roll, yes. <laughs> the Art of Fiction by Ayn Rand is coming, yes. It's, if you don't know this course, it's a, it's a talk for, uh, from 1958 uh, one, one year after Atlas Shrugged was released, when she did a workshop for inspiring writers in her own living room. So that's this course. And then we got uh, Ayn Rand on art and culture. Uh, it's, it comprises of three talks. One is art in education, our aesthetic uh, vacuum, and the simplest, simplest thing in the world. Do you know that short story about the writer? Remember that? So those three talks in this course. 
And then we got induction in physics and philosophy, a very simple problem to fix, just the solution to the problem of induction and the validation of reason, pretty easy, right? So this amazing course is gonna be released soon by Dr. Leonard Peikoff. We're gonna release John Locke's Political Philosophy by Harry Binswanger. We're gonna release uh, The Philosophy of Immanuel Kant. I'm actually uh, going through this course right now. It's great, it's first time I can understand what he said, why he's so evil, why, what, is, uh, what is the phenomenal and the noumenal, and, the f uh, and why, why the form of cognition invalid invalidates cognition, and why Einrad say uh, we are blind because we have eyes about this philosopher. Um, so Jason Ryan does, does a wonderful job explaining that in layman terms. Uh, Rationality and Objectivity by Tara Smith and uh, Aristotle, Father of Romanticism by Robert Mayhew. And uh, seizing or seize the reins of your mind, I always love that analogy that, that Ankar gives of focusing and feeling like right, right now I, I'm in focus and how effective I am right now doing the work that I was planning to do. And this is it. This is the focus time. I love this. And uh, lastly, or not lastly, one before last, objective thinking. That's the solution to all your problems, right? Objective thinking by Greg Salmieri. And lastly, uh, the first course by John, the late John Ridpath, The Philosophical Origins of Marxism. All of those courses, you should expect them to be on, on campus uh, being released, I, I think, once a month or so. So that's it. That's, that's what's coming. Do you know this? New ideal, right? Right? I, uh, I can't wait for the next, uh, you know, article. Right now we have over 100 articles on a new ideal. We've done a great job understanding who is the target audience for new ideal, not only the objectivist community, but more than that, who wants to read our point of view. And now we're over 9,000 subscribers. And I hope you, thank you. <laughs> um, if you see one of the writers here, Aaron and Ben and Ilan and, and Augustina, Ankar, of course, the entire team, Tom, uh, just check their hands. They're working so hard as an editorial team to come up uh, with something to write on a weekly basis. It's really, really, really hard. And they've been so disciplined, so hardworking to make this happen. Uh, we're thinking about deplatforming YouTube from our huge platform because they're not doing, uh, you know, no, I'm just joking. Um, <clears throat> so what have we, have we done on YouTube? If you remember, we did uh, quite a big move of moving all of our campus courses to YouTube free of charge, asking you to help us keep it free. So let's see what we've done on YouTube. You remember this one? Objectivism on happiness. So just to give you the backstory, Dave actually calls me one day and is like, we need to do something. Uh, you guys are underrepresented. Let's do something together. And while we are talking, we're thinking about how can we make it different? And very quickly, we come to the idea that let's start from the end. Why should I care about philosophy, let alone objectivism? What, what does it mean to me? It means nothing, right? So he said, you, you guys need to present it in a way that is less technical. Every time I talk, it's like very hard to get. It's like, let's start from the end. Let's start from happiness. Why are we doing this, right? And this, this is what brought life to objectivism on happiness. So if... You didn't um, notice we just uh, reached a quarter of a million views on this series. And it's amazing. It's way more than what we thought. We thought we were going to reach about 100,000. And we were amazed to see that things like Free Will by Ankar Gatte was number one in all of, the, all of the, uh, those videos. Uh, and we're learning better and better what really grabs people's attention. I want to show you a compilation of this. Hey everyone, I'm Dave Rubin and we're continuing our series on happiness right here on the Ayn Rand Institute YouTube channel. What is the relationship between morality and happiness? Happiness is this sort of emotional state or perspective, state of consciousness that comes from a certain kind of life. It's the, the internal sense that you're living, and true sense, you know, that you're living a certain life, the way it feels to live a successful uh, human life. And morality, as I think of it, is um, the principles that tell you how to lead such a life. Perspective one should have on oneself is the content of my character. 
is up to me. And it, it, it's not like I can snap my fingers and decide I'm going to be a totally different person. But you can make choices in the day to day of your life that's taking you in this direction or that's taking you in that direction. There's all kinds of things that you can make choices about that I think are direct choices so that you have control. And if you really viewed yourself as not having these kinds of choices, then you don't think of it as like these are the possibilities in my life. Which am I going after and why? There's a set of ideas that is that allows for human beings to flourish, that allows for individual human beings to be successful, that allows for the best in whatever culture you are to rise up. Anybody in the world, no matter what skin color they have, no matter what ethnicity, no matter what origin they're from, when they adopt this set of ideas, they thrive. You're a person. You're a person with a life. You're a person with a life that's only going to last a certain amount of time. What's a good life for a person to have? How should you lead your life? You have to think about the fact that there's a birth date and there's going to be an end date, you know, and if we're lucky, most of us want it to be long, far out there, but it's going to end and this is all you get. Make the most of it. So uh, it was great working with Dave, he's a, re a real professional. We got to understand how he does what he does so well. He's a true professional, the way he set up everything in his uh, studio and the, the kind of uh, organizing everything, scheduling everything, a true, a true experience. And we're gonna do more. Okay, so we've done great on content creation. Uh, let's talk about content distribution and engagement. Remember, we decided last year that is gonna be watch time per month. Let's see if we can really get people to consume our content. And what is our reach? So let's see how we've done. I wanna give a big shout out to a guy named Zane Mitchell. He's not here, he's back in California. Zane has moved from managing our Books for Teacher program to become our data ana uh, analyst. And he's built a wonderful, amazing platform that allows me as the CEO to ask any question I want about what's going on and he gives me the answer. So uh, we're collecting data from different sources, merging them together, uh, and on a weekly basis, he gives the executive team and sometimes the whole company or the whole organization, still thinking company terms, um, what's going on and why, why this piece is working on, on new ideal and why this piece, like uh, the, the false promise of stoicism, just crushes it because many other people are now interested in stoicism and so on and so forth, all, not just the data, but the insights behind the data. And he does an amazing job. So well done, Zane. Um, okay, so let's talk about what we've done as far as all content consumptions in hours since last Ocon. So this is July to now, or last June to now. We've grown from 69,000 hours consumed on our channels to 216 thousand hours watched. This is like between 24 and 25 years of watch time in a year. So dramatic growth. And uh, I, I consider it a huge success because we're, we're not seeing the end of it. It's just the beginning. This is everything uh, around campus only. And we're talking about, sorry, we're talking about a growth from 19,000 hours in consumption of objectivist courses to 64,000 hours of uh, consumption of objectivist courses. So great jump as far as how many people are consuming our content. This is our YouTube uh, subscription growth back from October. It's growing steadily, not as fast as we would like to, but it's growing. Uh, we learned how to use Instagram. It's a new medium, not a lot. It doesn't give you a lot there, but uh, you know, pictures with Ayn Rand quotes and Jennifer is doing a great job just communicating and uh, pushing content that people engage with. There's so many ways you can interact with people. And Facebook, we just passed the one millionth um, follower. Uh, this is across all of our assets. It's the Ayn Rand page, the Fountainhead, the Atlas Shrugged page, and ARI's page. And then came the mobile app. Okay, so uh, this thing that we launched back in mid uh, February um, did something amazing. Let me share with you what, what we were able to do. So first, we have over 15,000 downloads 
If you told me that within four months we would have over 15,000 downloads, I, I would think you were joking because it takes apps a long time to catch uh, if they're not like a huge game or, you know, crush, candy crush or something like that. Uh, so 15,000 downloads. And let me explain what happened. So I'll try to kind of explain. Here we saw a, a spike in our content consumption because of the amount of courses we released. If you remember in last July, last August, when we were kind of bombarded everyone with this is a new course and this is a new course. And then it just, uh, you know, stabilized around about two times to two and a half times of, the, of what we had last year. But then when we released the mobile app, this started to happen. So you can see the effect of the mobile app. Just think about how accessible this is. It's on the go, it's right there, you can download it, you can uh, play it offline. So many advantages of consuming this content and it's conceptual content. So you have to, don't have to see videos and slides running around, it's the ideas that you're listening to. So I find myself closing my eyes in an airplane, putting on a Leonard Peikoff <laughs> or, or, uh, or Harry Binswanger and just focusing and enjoying it. So I think the mobile app will go a long way. I just wanted to let you know uh, that right now, 193 out of the world's 195 countries have downloaded the app. Two countries in the world didn't download the app. Can you, can you guess who that is? North Korea? No, Iran downloaded the app. Cuba downloaded the app. Venezuela downloaded the app. The Vatican, good. <laughs> Praise the Lord, yeah. <laughs> so somebody please go to the Vatican, look at a Michelangelo and download the app there. So I just wanted to share uh, Americans and British people and Israelis have a lot to be proud of. This is the level of consumption, sheer consumption of hours. So think what it means per capita. So um, Canadians, Indians, Dutch people, Australians, start, start watching more courses. Uh, and if you ask, oh, you know what? If you guess who is the number one country when it comes to consumption per user, meaning who's uh, burning the midnight oil while listening to, um, I don't know, philosophy, uh, history of philosophy, right? Who, who, you know, will get a free Sophie book for me. No, not the UK. Not India. It's not Israel. Not Bulgaria. Poland, no. Georgia, no. Estonia, no. Norway, no. Germany, no. 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 Close. Europe, Europe. You, you don't, the, the people that sit for hours and hours and consume tons of content every day. They don't have to be many of them, but not Russia. Not Iceland. France, no. Poland? Poland? No. <laughs> Ireland, no. Bulgaria, no. So shout, I can't hear. Serbia, no. Austria, no. Estonia, no. Germany, no. Scotland, no. Holland? Holland. Holland. Netherlands. Let me, yes, the Netherlands. Exactly, <laughs> the Dutch. I don't know what's going on uh, in Amsterdam, but uh, every, every user in Amsterdam that downloads the app immediately consumes, I think, an average of five and a half hours a month. Uh, on, on the, so something great is happening in, in the Netherlands. Finland, UK, Japan, United States, Israel. So uh, we've got a long way to go. This is just scratching the surface. Those are not huge numbers, but it's, it's on the right to go in the right direction. So just to give you an idea what happened, we went from about two thirds of our content consumed on YouTube after we made the switch to YouTube and only a third uh, of it on, a on ARI's campus to now in four months, 
the Ayn Rand University app is at 41% of our content consumption as a channel, 48% is YouTube, and every time somebody tries to watch our campus on the web on, on, the, on a mobile phone, we actually immediately pop up a window that says download the app. So we're seeing a lot of people moving from consumption on the web to the app. So what's new on the app? So a first user experience, if you download the app, the first thing that plays is what is objectivism, who is Ayn Rand? So people will understand what it is. The lexicon is coming to the app. I don't know about you, I use it all the time. A very powerful search engine. And Ayn Rand talks and works. The essays in full, not all of them, but the majority of the essays are going to be there. Not the majority, I would say the, the important essays are going to be there. And many of the talks as well, so you can listen to many talks that are not included in the courses. And then we're going to add many more courses. I think we're going to go over 50 courses. courses. And if you don't know, you can download it locally, so you can listen, it, listen to it offline. And, um, Enjoy it. This is version 2.0. It's right now uh, in the in both app stores. If you update your app, you'll see all of this as in the in the 2.0 version. So this is the mobile app. Great. Um, you know, when I'm talking about the app, there's so much that goes into making a product. You can imagine the, the thinking process, the strategizing, what are we going to do, how it's going to look, the design, the technology. Are we going to develop ourselves or use a, use a template? All of that takes so much time. And when I started thinking about how the heck are we going to, uh, to do it, um, then um, I had to consult with someone I trust dearly. And uh, when I consulted with him, he said, you know what, I think I can do it. And then we started working together, and this guy has done it in, I think, one-tenth of the time that I expected it to take, and one-tenth of the cost. And I just thought uh, I owe him, um, because the symbol of all relationships among rational men, the moral symbol of respect for human beings is the traitor, and I feel I owe him. So I want to recognize this guy. Um, I will say what we're going to give him before I say who, who that is. We decided to give him a, a very special gift from the archives. So in Ayn Rand's folder, there are two pages of uh, notes uh, about this book that came out in 1956 uh, from the Fortune magazine, talking about successful, productive people. And you know, she had something about productive, successful people. Um, so she wrote notes about what she thought about the different articles. And I think this is a perfect gift for this guy who uh, started consulting to the Institute together with me about two something years ago when we came in and did the first workshop about content and digital marketing and then continued to uh, support me as I joined as a CEO. So I really want to recognize Mr. Lior Weinstein. Where are you? Is he here? Lior, not here? No, he is here. <laughs> Slow to react, come on. <laughs> Yes, yes, you're going to go on the stage. So not only are you going to get the two, the copy of those two uh, pages that Ayn Rand wrote about this book, you're going to get the first edition of the book from 1956. Wow. Thank, you. Thank you. Come so on. Much. There you go. Beautiful. We wouldn't have an app without this guy. Uh, let's talk about two books. Uh, one that I think uh, you saw, um, there was a luncheon about it, The Foundation of a Free Society, really the, the most extensive examination of Rand's political philosophy, edited by Greg uh, Salmieri and Robert Mayhew. Um, everyone who reads that book, I haven't read it yet, it's on my nightstand. But everyone who read that book that I trust said it's, it's a wonderful, most important book that, uh, that we need to have. 
The other book, I don't know if you saw it. Uh, I don't know if Barry's here. Is Barry here? Raise your hand. Uh, but uh, Barry edited. Um, I always tell people, uh, drop your Netflix subscription and subscribe to Leonard Peikoff. That's, that's the best thing. I, you know, if you, if you didn't listen to, uh, to Leonard's podcasts, they're now in a book, and we have that book available. Um, one of the, the, you know, the best podcasts that he, he has done over the years. I want to talk about our student programs. It's very easy to forget what we already have. So I wanted to highlight uh, one of the things that I found is ARI's most valuable assets, and that is the student uh, program, or what we call the Books for Teachers program. Again, it's easy to forget that hundreds of thousands of kids every day get an Ayn Rand novel to their hands in, 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 in the classes. And the amount of feedback we're getting from teachers and from students is overwhelming. It feeds the world's largest essay contest in the world that I know of. I don't know of any other uh, essay contest that is bigger than us or paying higher prizes than us. And I wanted to remind all of us how much of an impact we're making. I don't know about you, but make, do that test. Go to a high school teacher and ask them, or a literature high school teacher, and ask them if they know who Ayn Rand is or are they teaching Ayn Rand. First, most likely they know because she's now a classic because of ARI, as far as I'm concerned. And secondly, if they don't, have them call us. So, um, so let's see what some of the, uh, some of the uh, teachers had to say. When they are ninth grade, just coming out of middle school, they are unsure as to what their place is in the world. It was an awesome feeling just to give them the book and, and for them to realize like, I don't have to give this back. Like, I can take this with me. It kind of cuts right to the core of what you're trying to say. Oh, it absolutely challenges them. I think they really appreciated that webinar that we did because that gave a great perspective. The spontaneous flow of the conversation with Ben as he was fielding questions and asking follow-up questions uh, was great. I wish I wish we treated education as, as well as Zion Rand Institute does, where you value students, right? Because it's all about the students. I'd like to open the door to the fact that there are philosophies out there. There are ways of thinking about things. Keep doing what you do. I think it's um, meaningful and important. And one girl who resisted it, really was so difficult about it. She is, she graduated college it was about two years ago. And I heard from her last year, she said, I'm reading The Fountainhead for the third time. So sometimes it takes a while to sink in and then it just creates an epiphany. So uh, we've distributed 150,000 books. Uh, if can, yeah, 150,000 books this year. We could distribute up to 400,000 books, or even 450,000 books. And I'm saying that because over the years we've built one of the most amazing platforms of getting or penetrating into high schools, and we don't leverage that to the full uh, amount. The, the reason I know about it is bit because. Other organizations are calling me to see if they can use what we have to approach and to reach uh, teachers. We have a database of 44,000 teachers. That's huge. And if I showed you the, the map of the United States with a, a dot in every school that asks us, it'll be almost all covered. It's amazing. We've distributed books to 33,000 books, 4.3 4 million books up until now. And so some of the books are being used two, three, four, five times. So our estimation is almost a half a million kids are reading RAND every day. That's very important. So what one of the teachers mentioned is that we started doing what we call classroom webinars. If you, if you heard, uh, Aaron did and Ben did several webinars with, uh, with uh, classrooms. So what we started to think is how can we leverage that platform better, and we said we can actually gain more by offering teachers to do webinars about the book with one of our intellectuals to ask questions. And I don't have the clip here, but it's just amazing to see that Aaron did one, 
And um, one, cl one class did it, and then that class told the other classes, so the other classes asked to do it as well. So I think later they moved all to the library, and Aaron was talking to about 80 kids, and they're asking philosophical, philosophical questions about can my rights trump other people's rights? And then, you know, Aaron answering with, no, there's no contradiction there. And it went really, really deep. And they wanted to stay. They didn't want to go. It's like, no, no, we don't want to go to the next class. We want to stay, ask more questions. So we're thinking about how to do that at scale. Meaning, uh, we, and we actually asked the question, the question, would you want ARI to give you a webinar, a live webinar? And I think it was 220 uh, um, teachers immediately said, I want that. So we're going to scale that next year. And we created new teacher guides uh, just to update the, the old teacher guides. And now we're sending that together with the books. I have two drum rolls now. <laughs> We're going to launch the Ayn Rand ebook program. So we finally, finally have a deal with the distributor and uh, with the publisher, sorry, and we, ha we know how to do it. Uh, we're building a platform to be able to give teachers a code rather than a book and they will distribute the books, uh, sorry, the codes. And uh, I don't know if you saw uh, high schoolers lately, but they all have tablets from the school, so they can download it. Not only uh, we know exactly how many of them download the book, but we, can, uh, we think we can track how much they're reading and how they're reading. So that's only a pilot this year. We're gonna start it with a small number, but what we'll do, it will, uh, I think, first, to allow us to distribute many more books and lower the cost about, in the beginning, 30 to 40%. So that will allow us to get every dollar to do much more damage. Um, so this is the ebook program. And another thing we're going to do to leverage the penetration we have into high schools is to make a clear call to action in every uh, collateral that we send those kids inside the books and, and brochures and everything that uh, teachers are hanging on the walls to ask them, do you want to learn more about the ideas behind the book? And we're going to focus on the Fountainhead specifically. If that intrigues you, it doesn't matter if you read Anthem and you want to l learn a little bit more about this author, or you read the Fountainhead, or you read Atlas, we're going to do a seminar, a sum summer seminar in a college. We don't know if it's going to be in Clemson or in the University of Maryland. We're still kind of working the details, but we already got a grant uh, from a foundation to sponsor a summer, I don't, again, well, it might be three or four days long. Just think about how meaningful that could be to a 17, 18-year-old, 16-year-old to go through three, four days of uncovering the ideas behind those books. So I think this is, this is very meaningful, and I love it because it, again, leverages the assets we already have. Okay, let's talk about globalization. We haven't talked about, about this topic for a while. Again, I'm talking to you as Executive, remember, you're on the executive board now, right now. Um, what are we doing? How are we thinking about ARI uh, from a global perspective? So I want to go through several principles we've decided on. First, ARI is spreading objectivism globally. It's not just in the U.S. We are here to spread objectivism globally to the entire world. It's true in the United States, we want to see impact here, but the mission is not uh, you know, to distribute objectivism only here. Think about our intellectuals. Many of them are not US born. Many of them are immigrants. And we're seeing rising interest of Ayn Rand and the book sales is going up uh, outside of the USA. And we want to capitalize on that. But on the other hand, we want those centers that we support or help create be self-sustaining, independent, and not dependent on ARI financially, uh, maybe, maybe a little bit in the beginning, but we want them to be independent. We want those countries and those communities to support their own centers. We want them to have local impactful events and, and in-person events that, that make a difference and create meaningful experiences, not only you know, read the books uh, and, and watch the ARI campus from afar, we know the entire world is interested, but we want to get closer to them, and we want to do that through um, uh, centers that are, are local. And we want all of that network to use a scalable, reusable, shared infrastructure. Today, you know, if somebody in Spain wants to create a, a website on objectivism or translate this article, they to reach out to us, they create their own website and create, create their own YouTube channel. 
There's no need for that. We can create a scalable infrastructure that allows every social entrepreneur, they call it, uh, everyone who wants to, to impact their communities to just get those services from ARI. And I'll talk a little bit about that uh, later in the presentation. So this is how we think about expanding globally. Drum roll. So on top of this amazing lady who controls the entire Europe <laughs> operations, she's amazing. Annie, where are you? Thank you, Annie. Here you are. We'll tell you a little bit about the success in February. Um, it's just amazing what, ha what happens in Europe. And this guy is not one guy, he's five people, <laughs> honestly. This one guy, where's Boaz? Somewhere? Here he is, I'm back in there. This guy on his own in a little tiny office in WeWork in Tel Aviv is doing just amazing things. He it turns around uh, laws against uh, books and uh, creates uh, spin-off organizations like the New Liberal Movement in Israel. And he did uh, an event and 550 people came to listen, about li listen to liberty. And we have one objectivist almost this close to getting into parliament. And all of that because of the leadership of Boaz. So thank you, Boaz, for everything you're doing, including translating a lot of books to Hebrew. So the announcement, we got this amazing lady, Maria. Where's Maria? Maria, Maria. Here she is. She took on the responsibility, the brave move to open our Latin America Center. Um, it's an independent center. It's the, uh, the Ayn Rand Center in Latin America based in Buenos Aires. And we're going to do an event this year in September, the first Ayn Rand conference in Latin America in Buenos Aires in September. So we're looking forward to it. And as she told me, she's going to bring uh, how many? 300 uh, people, right? Yeah. Five? S sold. Okay, so uh, that's good. We're going to see what happens. I'm very optimistic, uh, you know, building on what happened in, in Prague. And there's another announcement. I met a wonderful, wonderful person. His name is Rob Roberto Rashevsky in Brazil, longtime objectivist. I was in a conference uh, um, about liberty, and there were 6,000 people there. And Roberto and several other people created that movement back in, starting in 1984. And Tens of thousands of people are now impacted to the point where they have a politician who really takes the market towards privatization and opening the market. And, uh, and so they say, oh, and the you know, lifetime award for liberty goes to Winston Ling. And this guy, Japanese, Brazilian, sorry, Chinese, gets on stage and talks about Ayn Rand for 25 minutes. It was amazing to see 6,000 people in the south of Brazil listening to a lecture about Ayn Rand and how impactful she is. So this all started because of uh, Roberto and some other people, and he's taking on the responsibility to uh, distribute um, our content in Brazil. It's not yet a formed center, but we're working towards that, and we're going to have the first Ayn Rand Con in Porto Alegre in September this year. Okay, so we've covered content creation and how we're distributing content uh, everywhere in the world. Let's talk about uh, intellectual development, one of the most important things we're doing. So it's very hard to describe the qualitative aspect of what's going on, and a lot is going on, so I'll just give you the numbers so and you understand. We got very serious in building what we call a funnel, a pipeline of people, identifying who's who and what they want to be, and how can ARI help them and maybe nudge them a little bit to be the next generation intellectuals. Because I think we have a, a positioning issue uh, with what does it mean to be an intellectual? What does it mean to be today a philosopher? No, I, I'm going to go to tech. And I'm talking to a lot of very, very smart people that said, uh, you know, maybe in a different life, life I would have been a, a philosopher, but I chose to go to business. So part of the things we're doing qualitatively is trying to define how can we describe how wonderful and amazing and important it is to choose to be an intellectual. And there is a marketplace for intellectuals, and you can see it. You see the need. You see people like Jordan Peterson and Sam Harris and, and Steven Pinker. They're doing really, really well by being, you know, by offering ideas to the market. 
So I'll give you the numbers behind it. Our intellectual network now, the mapped, the, the people that we consider an objectivist intellectual, both an intellectual professional, but of course a professional intellectual, has grown uh, from 141 to 188. It's mainly because of good mapping of knowing who's who and understanding who can give us what we call utilization for the sake of us uh, gaining from that, uh, from the perspective that they can learn, sorry, they can teach, they can speak, they can write, and so on. So you're, you're gonna see us trying to leverage a much, much wider network of intellectuals uh, to, help us, to help us do what we do. And most importantly, we've started mapping uh, potentials, people that have the potential to become an intellectual because they're engaging with us and they're now figuring out what they want to do. So uh, we've mapped 100 people. Some people think they're in that list and they're not, and some people don't know that they're on the list, so watch out. We're after you. Uh, the idea is that we really want to treat it as a recruiting, recruitment process, and I don't know how, if you know how sophisticated recru recruiting is today in the, in the business world. People are fighting for talent, fighting for talent. So we're going to apply some... Uh, uh, wisdom here to try and to, to get more people to the track of becoming the next uh, objectivist intellectual. A lot of work is being uh, done by Ankar and Jeff Shilaba and the team. Uh, we have a new uh, junior fellow program. Paul Task is a graduate from the um, University of Cincinnati in law and he's going to join us full time uh, very, very soon and he's going to join Augustina who's already our junior fellow program, and you want to increase that, but again, this is a very expensive program uh, to hire people full-time, um, and we're going we're gonna to try and, and, and add more people to that program of full-time mentorship. And there's a new type of fellowship that we created this year. We created a joint venture between CNX, this the gas company, this uh, um, energy company, and the Institute for Energy Research and the Ayn Rand Institute. Jordan McGillis uh, is a, an OAC graduate that uh, we both thought, ARI and him, that he could use more mentoring to, to increase the level of his critical thinking and writing. And he was working at, AR, at IER. So we decided to join forces and CNX is now going to sponsor it. And the, the, the grant is gonna be split between ARI and IER. And he's gonna spend his time both learning and getting mentored by our intellectuals, but also applying what he's learning in the field of energy. So I think it's a, a wonderful combination and we're gonna look into the opportunity of, of doing more of those types of, of uh, fellowships that are not 100% uh, at ARI. So welcome, Jordan. <laughs> How many students do you think we have at OAC right now? <laughs> I wish. 30? I heard. 80? No, 100 students. 100 students. It's, a, it's, it's, it's growth, but I don't know what you guys are waiting for. <laughs> it's really, uh, you know, whenever, whenever I, I talk about my first year, it's just an amazing, amazing experience. It's like reading OPAR with someone teaching you OPAR and answering all your questions about OPAR in, a, in the deepest, most wonderful way where you make new types of integrations, deeper and deeper and deeper integrations. So uh, 100 students, I just wanted to give you the highlights of what it is. Year one, we're learning about objectivism. Year two, we're doing a writing course, really trying to hone on uh, intellectual skills. And uh, year three is reading other philosophers, other books, and doing more uh, philosophical analysis and detection. Uh, after those three years, you'll become a, a better thinker. And I want to remind you that you can take that both as a, as a graded student, full-time, with all of the required readings and writing and so on. That takes time. That takes hours and hours every week. But you can also join. It's open for any auditor who wants to carve out about two, two and a half hours every week, open a Zoom, listen to an amazing presentation from one of our intellectuals, ask questions as a graded student, and then go to sleep, um, and, uh, and, jo and just join the next, uh, next, um, next week. It's really an, an amazing experience. I can't wait for a Tuesday 2, I think it's 2 p.m., 
uh, to to take another course. So hello, my is name is Joe Peter. Peter. I'm Tom Cowan. I'm Pooja. My name is Sam. I'm Agustina Rivera-Seed, and I'm a graduate of the OAC. The uh, OAC three-year program was a tremendously valuable intellectual experience. During the last three years, I've been able to deeply explore the objectives philosophy, develop greater writing skills, and critical thinking skills. The structured curriculum of OAC and the great classmates you find in other OEC students and auditors has really helped in a deeper level understanding of objectivism for me. One of the biggest values to me from the OAC has been a much better understanding of the operation of philosophic principles. I always say that you think you know objectivism until you do the OEC. It has really prepared me uh, in ways that I couldn't have even imagined when I started it to uh, pursue a career in an intellectual field. I highly recommend the OEC program. I would recommend the OEC to anyone who takes ideas seriously. Glad that I did it. I am sad that the program is over. Thank you very much. So, registration is open for next year. Carve out two and a half hours of your time every every week and you won't regret it. We're gonna have uh, uh, an OAC graduating cer gra graduation ceremony later. I think it's tomorrow. So anyone uh, of, you can see uh, those 16, I think, um, graduates, um, are, we're gonna celebrate tomorrow. And the reception is gonna be uh, tomorrow at between seven and 8 p.m. So anyone who's an alumni or a faculty is, is uh, welcome to join us. And as I said, uh, students, uh, July 7 is coming, so if you want to apply, uh, and auditors all the way to September 12th, you can talk to this guy, Jeff, who's responsible for our, our registration. Let's talk about Ayn Rand ar archives. Yes, we're doing something in our <laughs> archives. You know this book? I've read it. <laughs> so it's 25 year anniversary next year, and what we're gonna do we're gonna put it online. Yeah. So that will allow anyone in the world to read uh, her letters and really do the research and have access to, to uh, this amazing book. And uh, if you don't have, if you're not patient enough to wait till next year, because it's gonna come out, uh, I think mid next year, we're going to start publishing new letters that were never uh, released before, 40 of them, edited by Mike Berliner, uh, that are going to start uh, getting online tomorrow. So if you want more information about how to get access to those 40 new letters by Ayn Rand, never published before, just uh, subscribe to New Ideal and we'll tell you more about it. So that's one thing, great. The other thing we're doing, um, you know, people are getting old and uh, it's so important to capture um, the history of a movement and everything around it. Uh, so we've initiated the program where um, Lynn, uh, Lynn Zinzer is going around the country interviewing people uh, from the beginning of the, of the objectivist movement. I wanna give you an example of what it is. It was, it was very personal or social and I never got into any philosophic discussions except once I asked her about tears and, and you know, that uh, white people would cry at weddings, so to speak, you know, and that, you know, because how does that tie in with the idea that tears are always tears of protest? The essence of what she explained to me in that case is that the quiet wedding, the, the, the protest is that, the, the, you know, that this great event is so rare and protesting the rarity of having things that you're very happy about. So those were a lot of my good, you know, so I have very, I have very fond memories of mine. So we're doing 13 uh, additional videos right here. And if you think you can add to this, just find Lynn 
and talk to her about uh, scheduling an interview because we want to learn as much as we can about the, the movement and the history of the movement. Okay, so was it a good year? You think so? I think so. So how are we moving forward to 2020? Uh, so I'll tell you a little bit about the research we've done and we've done a lot of thinking. Uh, how do we leverage everything that we've done so far moving into the future or how we get better at that? So we broke the questions into, to, broke the, uh, or kind of thought about three different questions. One is who are we targeting? What are we targeting with? What kind of content do we want to uh, send our way? And how do we reach them? So let's take one question at a time. Let's start with the who, the persona. So we did a qualitative process of gathering a lot of brain power in, in several rooms and asking the questions, who are the people we want to attract? Because you can't go for everyone. You know, you can dream in your fantasies that you'll get to everyone, but look at you. you you're like a, a fraction of a fraction of people that got ignited by the ideas and millions of people, of people read Ayn Rand's novel, so not everybody gets it. And we want to try to be more effective in our messaging and the way we get to people to get to the right people. So I want to read you, that, I apologize, I usually not put a lot of words on a slide, but I think it's so powerful to really go through and understand where we're going with this. So what are the attributes shared among mentalities we want to attract? One, a value orientation is idealistic, takes himself seriously, has a sense that things are important, and doesn't like that others don't. Ambitious, acts on ideas, is interested in ideas primarily in order to pursue real values, not to win arguments. A rational orientation, finds excitement in integration, clarity, precision, is sensitive to contradictions and fallacious reasoning, wants things to add up and make sense, already thinks in principle and seeks out principled guidance. Intelligence, yeah, let's, you know, talk about ourselves here, right? Above average, but more important, he values his intelligence. Independent, suspicious of conventional wisdom, values knowing what's true above other considerations, is willing to hold unpopular or extreme views, finds conf confrontations with new ideas intriguing, not scary, values intellectual challenges. Those are the attributes we want to attract. We want to find the people that has, have those attributes. So, uh, I want to do a live experiment. We'll try it. Again, take your phones out. I hope that it'll work. And uh, I, want to, I want you to think about, we're gonna, I'm going to talk about four personas. There are more. But I wanted to talk to, for you to identify yourself in one of four personas. And I know it's always a mix and there are more. But think about the motivation, how you started, what grabbed you. And uh, try to identify yourself when I go through four personas. So the first one, and again, I'll read it. The philosopher, we call him the philosopher. Passionate about some hobby or category of values, usually a loner, not by choice, but because people don't understand him or things that interest him, somewhat nerdy and intellectual. Bored at school, may have bad grades or good grades without really having to try. Skeptical of teachers and the adult world generally. Thrives on an intellectual challenge or adventure. Can't wait to grow up. So think about yourself where you, where you were young. And we thought that the best time to reach that persona is in the teens. The second one, we call him the moralist. Has a moral fire. Has a visceral need to work out what is right. And led by, led by it to the field of ideas. Might be on a cultural left or religious. Maybe inward looking, concerned with her, her own soul. Or outward, some cause. Empathetic. Lean towards the humanities early, may have chosen a major in college based on the sense of meaning rather than practicality. Probably not very interested in practical policies, maybe political theory and ideology. Usually an activist may have been taken in by some bad or for bad ideas for good motives, i.e. led uh, others into an environmentalist activism, advocating socialism, animal rights or uh, was among the, the more active members of the church or a religious group or a camp, campus club. Bravery takes action in, on the basis of moral views, even if highly inconvenient. Best time to reach, we think, those people kind of mature around college. The third personas, 
the enter engineer entrepreneur, top of class, computer scientist or engineer, some science or technical field, an entrepreneur mentality, big picture, strategic thinker who wants to build or start something because it would be really valuable and cool to start things, likes engineering type fields but primarily avoided humanities because of the people they approach, the intellectual atmosphere, the sense of decline. Not really a geek, they are good with people, they know how to get what they want uh, and as needed for a desired purpose. Has a creative open temperament, tolerates risk in the pursuit of value, whether in business or intellectual life. And the best time to reach, they usually mature a little uh, later in the 20s. The last persona is the businessman, studied business or finance and developed a career in corporate setting or did something entrepreneurial in, in the fields or finance or real estate or anything else. Uh, person of action, may be slightly intimidated by ideas, doesn't consume a lot of content, but donates to ARI, enjoys events and talking uh, to intellectuals, has always felt business and money making are moral and was drawn to objectivism because Rand said, said it more clearly that, uh, that I've always, uh, what said more clearly what I've always believed, often was religious because he didn't know uh, the alternative now goes months without meeting someone he agrees with and comes to us for fuel. So those guys mature much later or realize it much later. So I know those are kind of extremes and there are several more, but if you can identify yourself, what you can do right now is just uh, write A, B, C, or D. Hopefully this will work. Let me see supposed to work. Give me a second here. Oop. One sec. Yeah, it's two, two, three, three, three. Two, two, three, 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 and supposed to uh, let me, uh, we'll try, if it works, it works, if it not, I ra ran it again, yeah, I think it's catching now, yeah, okay, okay, it's working, it's working, yes, wow, that's interesting, uh, A, B, C, or D, just text A, B, C, Oh, uh, uh, to the address 22333, you send an Ocon to, to log in. And once you're in, you press A, B, C, or D. Yeah, I thought philosopher would be a little high, but I didn't know it's going to be that high. Wow. It's a live experiment here. Wow, so a lot of philosoph philosophers' potential here, I think. That's amazing. Great. Okay, I think we get the picture. So a lot of philosophers. Awesome. Okay, let's continue. So we're, I, I just want to summarize this. We're putting a lot of effort and thought about how to identify those personas and the way we think about creating content is with those personas in mind. Where do they live? What do they do? What are they interested in? I'll give you one good example. We thought about where do you get those smart kids? It's in debate clubs, right? So we've made contact with the debate club association and next year, if everything works well, we're going to sponsor it and we're going to try to attract a lot of those smart, fiery, intelligent, uh, kids, smart kids, to, to, to consume more of our content and get interested in RAN. So uh, this, this is more of a qualitative process, but it's very important from a content marketing perspective to have an idea who you're talking to. Let's talk about the content, the type of content we're creating. What type of content should we create? So we've categorized all of our content into three segments. Introductory, easy, kind of this is what it is then kind of a middle level and advanced. And you would imagine that we would have a lot of consumption around 
introductory content, less on medium, and less on advanced. And it's not the case. And the reason is that for decades we've creating, we, we have been creating very advanced content and inter, not, not introductory content. If you read Rand, if you read, listen to Leonard Peikoff or any one of our other intellectuals, it's pretty deep and it's, it's requiring a lot. So all of the content on, on the campus, on the mobile app right now, it's pretty substantial. So somebody opens it. I'll give you an example. So we give a talk, Yaron gives a talk, and you got you know, maybe 10,000 people, and the call to action is download the app. They download the app, and then what? Four hours of Leonard Peikoff? What's, how, do they, how do you start? So what we found out is that we just don't have a lot, of, a lot of introductory content. What is this about? Why should I get motivated? Is it relevant to me? And by the way, uh, today the novels are not the, the first thing people do. Today's kids need to be motivated and convinced that it's worth their while to pick up a book, something they're not used to do. So um, we're thinking about what type of content do we have today and what type of content do we need? And, and from that, we've decided to focus on introductory yet deep content. I think it's a false dichotomy to think about, yeah, introductory needs to be shallow and just you know, zoom over things. No, it can be that the differentiation could be in how deep the introductory content is. So introductory yet deep, contextual and relevant to people where they are now, not where we want them to be, right? Where they are now, some of them have very bad, bad ideas and habits in their head. Does not presume prior knowledge. I you know, spent uh, time with people that are very, very, very successful on YouTube and other places, and they all say the same thing. Just don't assume any prior knowledge. You have a concept, you introduce a concept, explain what it is. Engaging and inspiring. It has to be relevant to where they are and what they want right now, not what we think they need to want. Live and interactive, there's nothing like an interaction. And you'll see more in our uh, channel strategy moving forward, that there's nothing like a face-to-face -face interaction, something that is more meaningful rather than watching things online. And supports a gradual learning path. We haven't been very good in understanding what should go before what. I don't know about your experience, but I've stumbled all over, I read Opar, and then I read Romantic, and I, then I read, I think, you know, The Fountainhead, and then Romantic, and then Opar, and then it's a, whatever somebody told me that I should read, I read. There was no, uh, nobody curated a path for me. So we're going to try to make it more, uh, you will see coming out playlists that we say, if you're interested in that, you know, this is the kind of the order we recommend. Two drum rolls. <laughs> This is Ayn Rand speaking series. Freedom of speech means freedom from interference, suppression, or punitive action by the government, and nothing else. It does not mean the right to demand the financial support or the material means to express your views at the expense of other men who may not wish to support you. Freedom of speech includes the freedom not to agree, not to listen, and not to support one's own antagonists. A right does not include the material implementation of that right by other men. It includes only the freedom to earn that implementation by one's own effort. Private citizens cannot use physical force or coercion. They cannot censor or suppress anyone's views or publications. Only the government can do so. And censorship is a concept that pertains only to governmental action. Human rights cannot exist without property rights. The destruction of property rights leads to the destruction of all rights and all freedom. So the, I just a caveat, this is not the final one. I hope you like it. This is work in progress. 
just to give you an idea how complicated it is, so you take an Ayn Rand's talk or a segment. First, it's amazing to hear how clear she is. There's no buts and um, and it's just the, the people that work with us on the, on the, on the media companies like, well, we can't, we, we sh we're not touching the, the audio there. <laughs> you know, it's, it's as, it, as it is, it's just amazing. And uh, the, the trick is, and uh, what, this is why it's so hard to really try to figure out to write a story to animate what she's saying to grab people with, uh, I don't know if you watch Prager University, they're so effective. We're trying to do something like that. So just a caveat, this is not a final, we're, this is a, a, a sketch that we're working on and we have several in the pipeline. But the idea, this is so wonderful, we have I think 200 uh, audios of Ayn Rand talking about different contexts and, uh, sorry, concepts. And, this is the best script ever. We, we try to think about maybe should, we should write scripts, but she wrote perfect scripts. So you'll see us coming out with uh, This is Ayn Rand speaking series that is going to hopefully have more people think about who's that thinker? Why is she saying that? That's interesting. Well, let me Google her, right? So that's, that's one. The next uh, announcement is very special to me because it's something that's gonna require a lot of energy from people in the Institute a lot of consistency, but in my mind, I call it landing pods. Landing pods is, you know, for me, if you talk to someone about Ayn Rand and they're interested, what are you asking them to do, right? Read a book. I say, okay, I'll read the book. But there's not a lot you can tell. It's like, go watch, you know, uh, a course online. And we thought that one of the things, that, the things I said about a live experience is so important is that we want to allow people to have more access to our intellectuals. So we decided to do something that is a wow for me. We call it the weekly objectivist webinars. And what that means is that every week starting, I think we chose to start on, Sunday, on Saturdays, every week we will broadcast a live hour of a concept we're gonna talk about. It's like a TED talk for about 15 minutes, 20 minutes, and then we'll open it up to questions for about 30, 40 minutes. So at any given week, if you meet someone and they want to know more about Ayn Rand, they can join a live conference, a live Zoom webinar, listen to, a, to an objectivist more than anything, the objectivist methodology of thinking about concepts, and then shoot, you know, whatever question you have about different subjects. And we will allow people to argue with us and we'll be very accommodating in those webinars. But I think it's, it's a wonderful opportunity and we're gonna experiment. We see if people show up and how many people show up, it's global, we'll try to do it at a time when everyone can join. And we're starting in Saturday, July 20th. So our intellectuals are gonna rotate and introduce different concepts. It's gonna be sporadic on different uh, things. It's not gonna be like a course. Every time it's gonna be uh, uh, a presentation about something else. So if you meet someone, you want to introduce them to objectivism, this is a great opportunity, the weekly objectivist webinar starting July 20th. If you want to register and know what's going on, if you text webinar to this number, again, you got your phones out already, um, you will be registered and you will get notifications on an ongoing basis what the next webinar is about and uh, how to register and so on. Uh, if you do that now, by the way, it will automatically register you to the first webinar. So we will get a link how to download Zoom if you don't have it and participate in the first webinar. Okay, let's talk about how do you get to people. So you got, you understand who you're targeting, you understand um, what type of content you want to create for them, you got it all, how do you get it to them? So we've, I think we've, we've done a pretty good job solving the, what I call the channel uh, challenge of getting to people. So we have, uh, I don't know if you saw our YouTube channel, channel, for instance, it's beautiful right now. It's all standard, all of the thumbnails look the same, it's really easy to follow, and so on. And um, again, I, I just want to say one thing, it's obvious, the books and the novels are irreplaceable. If you can get someone to read books, we don't need all of this. So get them to read the books more than anything. That's the best way to get to them. But I want to tell you the story of Prague. So last Ocon, we were getting together and we're saying we should do something in Europe. And the idea came to do uh, the first Ayn Rand conference in Europe. And the estimations were, yeah, we'll get 50, 80 people and so on. So we announced it, that we're going to do an event in mid-February in the cold Prague. 
good beer, but very cold. And um, then this register, we opened the registration and whoa, 50, 100, 150, 200, 250, 280. And every day, Mary Lee was like, well, we've got 300 people, 400, 430 people registered. And we had to, thank you. Thank you, Mary Lee, by the way, and Annie, and everyone that contributed. There were a lot of people that were behind it. But what we learned is that there is a thirst and a hunger for ideas, and people are waiting for us to get closer to them. They want to engage. And another thing that I want to tell you about this that really amazed me when I asked the question, how many of you read Ayn Rand? You would assume 80, 90 percent, right? But only 50 percent of them read Ayn Rand. The other 50% came because their friends told them that you cannot afford to miss this. And I can't convince you, I guess, to read Atlas, but at least come with me. Uh, people drove with buses from, what, 40 countries? 41. Are there 41 countries in Europe? <laughs> 41 countries. And it was amazing. We had to move the, uh, uh, the, the location from one to another because it got bigger and bigger. And it was an amazing conference. There was so much energy and so many questions. And we actually didn't plan the content really well because we thought it's going to be, you know, just the objectivist uh, thought. And people were like, can you tell me what it is? Can you do like an intro to the intro? So we had to change it on the fly and say, okay, go grab lunch, but come really fast. To, we'll give you an introduction to objectivism. And it was buzzing at the end, really buzzing with excitement. And um, I think we can double. I think we can double every year if we have a, a friend, bring a friend, and so on. So we've, we take, we've learned a lot from this. And really, uh, for me, it showed how powerful it is to get closer and say, Ankar and Yaron and Ben and, and Aaron and Ilan and all of our thinkers are coming to you. And people just come out and from the, wherever they are, and they, they, they register. So we're announcing, oh, by the way, I'll just give you the idea of what, what feedback we got. The accessibility to the AI intellectuals, new friendships. People are, they don't know people around them that know those ideas. Clarify several questions at length. I wanted to ask a question. I told you last year, my question about infinity, it was stuck here. I couldn't, I couldn't get it. Uh, how do I think about infinity? Is it valid? And, and they don't have anyone to engage with. And some of them describe it as the best days of my life. It's really life-changing. So the power of network, the power of people attracting other people. Just think about how many new people we got to sit down for three days and listen to rational thinking. It's amazing. So here's the snare drum again. We're going to introduce the ARI Ambassador Program. And by that, I mean that every one of you who wants to get in, engage, engaged and involved in activism and trying to attract people in your area, in your community, we're going to give you all the services possible to make it happen. So in technology, we have this concept called as a service, software as a service, platform as a service. I see a lot of people nodding here. We, that means that in order to scale, you want to do a real separation or division of labor. I don't care how Google tells me where I am and where I need to go. I just ask them and they give me a response. And we uh, mark those responses or those services that they expose with lollipops and that they are called APIs. So that's an application kind of programming interface that I ask some, another program what it is, they give me the answer. I have no idea how it does it. And then I focus on my own services. So I thought it would be really cool to take out lollipops out of the ARI brand and give people all of the services they need to become really effective activists. Now, we don't know what people need, but we're going to start to experiment with, you tell us what you need. If it's content, the weekly webinars, I think, could be a really huge vehicle for that because you don't have to create content on a weekly or a monthly basis in your book club. You just, let's watch it and let's discuss it, right? Or technology, we can create a website for you or just put you in a listing so you, people can interact with you or build your uh, Facebook page, train you how to do uh, Socratic, uh, uh, you know, discussions, uh, marketing material, how to market to your local community. Maybe we can help you with some, some uh, local uh, advertising, how to manage it, how to do succession planning. So you make sure that if you leave 
the person uh, after you takes over, all kinds of things. And even if you're a poor student and you don't have money for pizza, we'll help you with pizza. So um, that's, I think that's a really cool concept to think of, of ARI as a platform. We cannot change the world on our own. We're like 34 people. That's not a lot. And uh, how can we make a ding in the universe? We just allow people to build on our network, and sorry, on our platform as much as possible. So we're gonna start this process. We did two webinars already. We started con contacting people that we know are already activists. We have, what, Adam, 30, 30 something people already active. And we started asking them, what would you need? How should it look like? And so on and so forth. I have to say, it's not an ARI, clubs everywhere. No, it's, it's going to be their clubs. They're going to do whatever they want with it and with our services. So we're, we're excited about it. And another drum roll. To, to support this uh, pro process, we're introducing regional Ayn Rand conference. I think the peak of, of what can happen in the community is to get together maybe once a year and meet everyone and discuss what's going on. So we have one in Atlanta happening every October, November. We're gonna do the next Europe, European one in Warsaw in February this, this year. We're gonna do a Buenos Aires in September and then a week later we're gonna all fly eating steaks in, in Buenos Aires to Brazil. And we're gonna do this event again in Porto Alegre. We're gonna do one in Chicago and we're gonna do one in Orange County in our own office. So if you're around us, we're gonna let you know when it's happening. And this is the more, most important one, by the way. When are we gonna do the next one? It's up to you. You sign up about 50 people, we'll come to you. And it's gonna be short, it's not gonna be an Ocon. Thank you, thank you. Uh, it will require a lot of effort. But we're committed to uh, about maybe a day, uh, you know, uh, maybe a, a, a reception on a, on a Friday and then a full day Saturday in every city that will, you know, show that th th there's demand. And I think that will allow that community, it's like the highlight of the year of a community. And uh, I'm hearing a lot of people that want to lead communities, want to get communities together. It's like, we don't have enough traction. You know, it's very hard to create the content and to advertise and to bring people in. So we're gonna help you in any way possible. So I think those re regional events can go a long way. And we, uh, that's another thing in, in a way we're gonna use the expanded network. So not only ARI uh, intellectuals are gonna travel, but again, we're gonna experiment. If it works, it works. If there's no demand, we'll wait a little longer. But that's what we're offering. So how those, uh, those three initiatives around channels are coming together, this, this is the way I think about it. You can introduce people to the weekly webinars like, you know, just try it out, see if, if you like the ideas. If you like it, you know, we're actually getting together here in Chicago or Orange County, wherever, wherever it is. We're meeting once a month in this restaurant and we're discussing or we're debating or we're doing something, maybe a Toastmaster-like kind of uh, organization. And it's organized by someone or a group of people that are going to get some resources from ARI. And once a year, we're going to work together, all of us, to try to bring ARI here to give us a day and a half or maybe a day of, of content to really inspire us or teach us a little bit more about objectivism. So this is, in a way, I see how we can uh, expand and grow exponentially. So this is how those three strategies come together. Only this year we're going to grow from 100, what is it, 263 people participating our, in our events um, without Ocon to all, almost 1,200 just because of those, uh, the Prague and the additional um, conferences we are adding in Buenos Aires and in Porto Alegre. So you see the growth, just doing a couple more. This is the kind of growth I want to see. I want to get to 3,000 and then to 10,000 people experiencing something meaningful. I remember my first Ocon. I don't know if you remember your first Ocon. It's really life-changing. And uh, then I went, by the way, I, I had an excuse. I'm a mentor in Atlanta. I went every year. It was the best content. Going to the student conference every year in Atlanta. It's just, uh, I was there all the time and then as a mentor as well. So if you remember my concentric circle from last year, remember when we said the core of what we are, if we lost all of our funding, we will defend the legacy, we will defend the archives, and then what we want to do then, start to educate 
Now I think we're kind of breaking out of that circle because I think we did a, a great job this year into building and fostering communities. And then maybe one day we'll go even in wider than this. I'm going to close by uh, talking about the dollar sign. <laughs> this all costs money. I have to say we're now at the point in ARI that uh, we're right on the red line. We're doing so much and we're, again, 34, I'm not sure if we're 34, 35, but a very small amount of people. They're working really, really, really hard. And we can't do more because we, we don't have the money to, uh, to do it. Um, I think we built some foundations that allow us to do much, much more. So we need more money. And um, if you remember last year, I've introduced the uh, ARI membership program, and a lot of you responded. Immediately, we got to over 400 people giving us an auto pay payment, uh, supporting ARI in a very, very predictable way. And I always say I would rather have a dollar, a predictable dollar, than two unpredictable dollars in the sense that I can plan. I know who I can hire and what can I do and so on and so forth. So the auto pay, the idea of consistent giving is so powerful. So um, to clarify, this ARI membership, that means that you are an ARI member, means that if you're on auto pay or you're giving us two consecutive years, you're an ARI member. And that means that now we're expanding the program. So a lot of you are ARI members. It's going to encompass about 1,000 people, just above 1,000 people that are consistent givers to ARI. And we want to promote this. We want to have more people thinking about ARI as a long-term investment, not one, you know, once, uh, you know, every several years. So um, this is the ARI membership program. And every year we're going to give an annual gift. By the way, people told me you can opt out of the gift. If you don't want us to spend money on the gift, that's great. This year we're going to give something very... Uh, very meaningful. We're going to give the Frank Lloyd Wright cottage studio design that he did for Ayn Rand. So the story behind it is that in April 1944, Ayn Rand received a letter from Frank Lloyd Wright, and uh, she described it uh, like closing a circle. Uh, she asked him if he, could design, if he could design a house for her, and he replied, of course. Uh, in 1946, she received a scheme uh, it says here, a scheme for a compact dwelling for a writer who loves the idea of organic architecture and won't take less for a home. So that's a very... <laughs> now, as you know, um, in 1951, she, she moved to Manhattan, lived there for the rest of her life. So the house who was, suppo su was supposed to be built somewhere either in Connecticut, Texas, Arizona, or Florida was never built. But this, we, we chose to give you the blueprint of this and uh, the letter that he wrote to her. Um, I will just read you a little bit of what that letter says. My dear Miss Ran, I've read every, work, uh, every word of the Fountainhead. Your thesis is the great one, especially at this time. So I suppose you will be set up in the marketplace and burnt for a witch. <laughs> Your novel is novel with a capital N. Unusual material in unusual hands, and I hope in an unusual end, to an unusual end. So far as I have unconsciously contributed anything to your material, you are welcome. Thanks for Ellsworth Tui, a great portrait. His time is up. Um, so he goes on and on to describe it. So that's what's in the letter. So if you're an ARI member, you choose to trade with us. By the way, only 30% of you are ARI members. So if you want to trade with us, and it starts at $10 a month. Subscribe in our, um, in our fundraising. They'll be wearing yellow vests. Yeah, here they are. You can see them at the back. Yellow vests, that will really help us. So whatever you can give, see this as an investment. I think your dollar is working really, really hard at ARI. And if you do, uh, we'll, we're doing a raffle of this wonderful, wonderful thing. It's a one-of-a-kind romantic manifesto lap. So uh, we'll be doing a raffle for this thing. Um, and if you're an AR member today between 6 and 7 at Hope ABC Room, we're going to have a happy, ha happy hour, so please, please join us. Um, the last thing I want to talk about, this is something pretty emotional. Um, I've got to know this thing called the Atlantis Legacy and what it means, where people basically say that, uh, you know, uh, I want... 
the legacy, my legacy to live uh, onwards and their commitment to the ideas of Ayn Rand and spreading rational ideas. For me, it's the ultimate uh, commitment. Um, and so we have several hundreds of people in this uh, plan. You don't have to be 75 to think about it. You can be 35, 40. It's a commitment, and I'm going to make that commitment right now to show you what it takes. You take a 401k uh, beneficiary um, form, and you add ARI. You can say whatever percentage it is, and you sign it, and you send it back to your 401k, and you're an ARI Atlantis Legacy member. That's it. And by that, you're saying, I'm committed to those ideas. I don't know how much I will give, you know, but I'm planning to leave something behind me for the legacy of objectivism and Ayn Rand. So if you choose to do that, we're going to have a planning your legacy luncheon to give you a lot of information about that process. So any, everyone, anyone is welcome to join us on Wednesday, 11.45 for lunch. And then if, you, if you're an Atlantis legacy member, we're going to have a lunch on Thursday. Um, and one last thing, all of this thing that I've described is a small group of people. This is who they are. So if the ARI, ARI employees just stand up for a minute and let's acknowledge them. Thank you very much. I've worked in the Silicon Valley, I worked in tech. Those guys work so, so hard. And the type of work is just unbelievable because it's, con it's, you know, in, in tech or in any other profession, you can go for days without really doing something really, really meaningful. Those guys do something meaningful every day. It's amazing. And I want to take the opportunity to thank a wonderful board of directors that supports me and allows me to do what I do. And to every one of you, really, it's just, uh, such an amazing experience to be here and to shake hands and to see smile and hugs and so on and so forth. So thank you very much for being here and thank you for a, a great 2019. Looking forward for, for even a better 2020. Thank you so much. And if you have any questions for me, not like last time, uh, you're welcome to ask me about the strategy, about what we're doing, what we're not doing and so on. I can't hear you still. Uh, open the microphone. Yep, it's up. Okay. For about 20 years, ARI staff have been wondering how to change the culture. For the first time, we got it. You got it. You're, what you're doing, you got it. <laughs> now we know how to do it. Thank you. Uh, so this is very impressive. And uh, for those of you who read the newspapers, you know how awful the current culture is. What do they have to offer us? Unearned guilt? Persecution for success? Harassment for unpopular views? Demand for more and more of our money? Demand for our assets? Demand obedience? Harassment of every successful businessman, especially if they're very successful. So they have nothing to offer us. But we do. Life. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ed. I really appreciate it. And I agree. I think I always joke with, with the, the employees that we're sitting on, a, on a, a barrel of dynamite. And we just need to ignite it more and more because we have the best ideas in the world, life-changing ideas, and we have so much to offer. So I see this mainly as a marketing challenge. We, we have decades of amazing content. Um, and... Um, this is, the, I, I completely agree. We can change the world and, and, and as the way I see it, it's a function of trying to squeeze the time between now and the next renaissance, right? That's what we're trying basically to do. Yeah, I just want to second that. Thanks for the tremendous progress. It's, thank it's you. kind of incredible work, so thank you very much. Um, I'm wondering if you have any plans for uh, an iPad app uh, to complement the mm. iPhone app. Especially Find Lior. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I don't know yet. We'll, we'll we're, 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 we're planning something about what we're going to do next with a mobile app because we have capacity. Uh, we have an arrangement where we have dedicated de development capacity. We decide what we want to do with that capacity. iPad app is one of the ideas. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. You. And it makes sense because, Videos. yeah, great media. Yeah. Uh, regarding the weekly webinar, 
Um, are there any plans to archive them or put them on YouTube yeah. after the fact so that uh, people can refer to them? Is there be concepts and things that people might have missed during the live? Yeah, um, so to give you an idea how, how I think about con content creation, right now as we speak, we have a studio in the 31st floor um, and uh, we're shooting videos right now with all the intellectuals talking about different things because everybody's here. So we're leveraging the fact that everyone is here we're recording it and we're storing it, we will do something with it. Because it's very hard to create quality content. And this is what we're gonna do with the webinars. We're gonna record them, and I don't know how we're, we're gonna, um, uh, in a way, publish them, if we need to edit them or not, but for sure we'll have a rep repository of recorded webinars where you can actually uh, listen to them, not, not live, yeah. So we can refer it? Yes, and you can refer them to a repository. Where it will be and how we call it, I don't know yet, but it'll be either on our website, our mobile app, and so on and so forth. Every Zoom, every Zoom conference we're gonna record, yeah. Hello, uh, you mentioned the importance of Ayn Rand books. Can you comment on the sales of Ayn Rand's books? Are they increasing, yeah. hopefully? Yeah, I wanted to bring that, uh, well, that data is in a way, uh, uh, a little bit of a problem to share uh, and I don't know what it is with the publishing industry they're so old <laughs> and so behind they now gave us data about 2017 uh, so I can share with you that all in all it went up from from 2016 and mainly because of international sales uh, US is somewhere there there was a spike in Fountainhead in 2017 that I don't know I can explain but it's, it's not spiking, it's like kind of flat. Um, and there's growth in international, there's a little decline in the US. And I think for the first time in 2060, if I'm not mistaken, uh, international is higher than US for the first time in history. Yep. Just a quick comment. I absolutely loved that you had real metrics up there, that you had real charts. Um, it's something I've wanted to see for so long. I was blown away by it, and I just I hope you do so much more of that. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Uh, and you're raising a great point. You know, when I joined, it was uh, very confusing. You come from a world where money is the ultimate metric, right? You you make more money, you make more profit, and here, you in a way, I was pretty confused up until the point where I said, "Where's my metric?" How can I concretize success? And I started asking, how do we visualize success? What's going to happen next year? And it's very hard to concretize. And this is why metrics are so important. Let's focus on one thing. I want the, to see this number go up. And sometimes the number go up, goes up for the wrong reasons. But still, you know that you're making progress. So that's kind of the uh, method of thinking that I brought to the Institute to say, I want this number to go up. How are we getting it up? And then you got all kinds of amazing ideas. Some of them are quick wins that you don't have to do much. Just put everything on YouTube, see what happens, right? And then the idea, actually, I told, told you about this secret group called the ARI Hackers that I consult with. It's like, it makes perfect sense. What are you trying to do with this content? So metrics give you, it's like grounds you in reality and says, what do you want to see? What kind of impact do you want to see? So this is why you'll continue to see us focus on very specific metric and not too many of them. You didn't mention the campus clubs in your presentation. Can you comment on what the status of that is, or is it no longer an area of focus? Yeah, so, as you know, I, I'm, uh, I don't know much about it, but I, ARI used to have, uh, to have a campus cl club program, and it kind of went a little down. I don't think about the, uh, the idea of uh, the ARI ambassadors program as uh, a campus club, but it can be, a version of it could be an, a campus club. If you think about it, if you want to open a campus club, we're going to give you the same services as uh, uh, people meeting in a restaurant once a week in Richmond. Um, so it's not particularly a, a campus club program, but a version of it can be a campus club. And one of the things that we will look into is how do you build an infrastructure that is, it can be sustainable over time? One of the things is, that I learned from other programs is succession planning. So if you leave because you're really good in marketing, the idea is it just doesn't die out. It's, you know, it continues to grow. So um, again, just starting this process, we'll learn a, more about it, and there's gonna be a feedback loop on a weekly basis almost between the, uh, the, the ambassadors and, and uh, our, our team. Actually, Adam is leading it. 
And uh, please come to the ambassador uh, hour that we're going to have. It's not like we're gonna, we know everything. We want to ask you a lot of questions. And let's start this pro process and see where it, where it leads. We have more technology than ever. It's easier to market locally, to let people know it exists. I know that when I when, after I read Atlas, the first thing I did is I went to, I remember Kelly Elmore and, um, and uh, forget, Jen, Jen Casey, uh, were doing something in Atlanta, and I just Googled them and found, a, and I met them in a restaurant. And it was great to see people around me that I'm not the only crazy guy in the world. And then they did a, a local conference called, uh, it was ATLOS, the Atlanta Objectivist Society, and they were lecturing to themselves. <laughs> it was without ARI, it was great. I really loved it. I got to, we got to sit in, in, in circles and discuss ideas. It was, it was great. So, um, but then Jen opened a, a business and there's no ATLAS anymore. So uh, that's what I'm saying about thinking in, in a scalable mindset, is thinking about how that can be started and then grow, growing over time. Thank you very much again, and hope to see you soon. Thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to never miss a video.